second flag here across. Muller on the inside, and he's through. Reed tucks it behind. Aiello shuffled by. Jason Play, this is me too. Max Bird, who is sideways and getting a contact with James Gordle, who gets airborne and sideswipes uh, Lewis Brown. And historic hat trick for Fortin and Luke Browning here at. Alton Park. Round the outside is going to be a virtual dead heat between the two of them. Jordan Wynn has his nose in front. Here comes Gelzinis, who I think was just ahead. Gelzinis takes the place of the championship by 37 thousandths of a second. And Ben Green's going to take his first double win. The Century team are delighted. Oh, and they're sideways, completely sideways. Gets it back together. Holds it. What a save by Plato. But Jones Cleland is attacking so much. He's up on two wheels. He attacks again as they go to the right hander and love him. And they both spin. They're both out. Hello everyone and welcome to The Undercut, for those of you who are listening and for those of you who are watching uh, via our YouTube stream. I'm Jake Sanson, he's Paul O'Neill. Well, Knock Hill, I guess the best way to describe Knock Hill from the outside is service that is uh, normal service resumed, is that a, be- a good way to describe it? I think so, yeah, I think that, um, you know, speaking in the studio with Steve Ryder for, uh, for ITV, um, I said the last words I said to Steve were normal service resumed. And the reason I said that really was two two things. Colin Turkington was back winning um, and Ash Sutton and Tom Ingram just pulled a little bit of a gap in the championship um, after their successful weekend. So, yeah, I think you have absolutely nailed it there, mate. Normal service resumed because it looked like it was a 58 car battle, didn't it? Uh, at Ulton Park when we left there, but not now. It's uh, looking like a, not a two horse race, but it is definitely. Um, it's definitely they're just edging out. You know, the cream is rising to the top, mate. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, and you did say last time out when we spoke about things at Alton Park, you did say if Colin Turkington doesn't win at Knock Hill, as far as you were concerned, it's game over for the championship. He did raise his game, and he did need to get himself back into the fight. Yeah, you know, uh, sometimes I say too many things to be honest. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, I mean, I'd like to think that I'm not always right. I'm not perfect, like uh, like you know, like everyone else is human. But I, I knew that it wasn't just the points, Jake. To be honest, it was the psychological side of things. Yeah, he needed to win because you know, with nine kilos on board, I think it was when he went into the into qualifying for Knock Hill, he he had there was there was no excuse not to be on the front row. You know, it's a rear wheel drive track to a point, and he needed to make use of that. He did. Um, I think that he had a setback in race two. He can smile all he wants about being second place, but that's that that pressure that put Ash Sutton put on him um, and made him have that mistake into um, into the chicane in race two just shows you how much Ash wants it. Um, and it's like role reversal. That what Ash did to Colin was what Colin used to do to everybody else um, when when he was having it all his own way. That's that's how I see it, mate. So yeah, big psychological things um, happening there. Yeah, we're definitely going to talk about that. Obviously, being in Knock Hill, it is the furthest north we go. And I want to make a point because I've seen it again on social media. I see this every single year when it comes to Knock Hill. Everybody's like, oh, it's a mission. It's a trek. We've got to go up to Scotland now for this one. I'm sorry, guys. I don't mean to attack anybody for having an opinion, but it's the British Touring Car Championship. We need to go to, in my opinion, all four countries. I would love to be able to say we could do a round in Wales. I know that Anglesey and Pembrey are not actually up to the standard yet. And hopefully one day, I know there's some funding potentially going into Anglesey. Maybe it might become good enough. It'd be great if we went and did something over in Ireland at Mondello Park again. For me, you've got to be a British touring car championship. It can't just all be down south. It can't just be all focused in one, you know, like motorsport valley. It's got to be all over Great Britain. So if you don't like it, don't go. But Knock Hill is a very important part of the calendar. It is. And people, you know, like Matt James from Motorsport News, he, you know, he always says it's the jewel in the crown. It, it, it really is. It's like, I cannot explain to people. I'm Today, I'm at Alton Park. That's why I'm dressed in a mini challenge um, overalls. I'm coaching today and I'm coaching some new people that are into racing and they always ask me what's your favourite track in the UK and I've got two. Well, I've actually got three, but we'll say a Brands Hatch GP, I love going there, but also I absolutely adore Knock Hill as a driver and I've been there for the last 10 years as media um, and you can go there and you can pick holes out of the place and say, oh, it's this and it's that and it hasn't got this and that. I don't care. The place is awesome. Support, support the series, you know, um, 
and support the circuits. It's just, it's a mega place. You will not find one touring car driver on that grid that doesn't want to be there. It's a mega, mega place. And, you know, and Scotland as a, as a, as a country is beautiful. Uh, yeah. Anglesey as a, as a place, beautiful. You know, people just don't like to put the miles in. And, and you know, I, I drive everywhere, as you know, mate. And we have got the best circuits in the world. We, we have, for a small little island, we've got the best places in the world. And we're, de- we're so fortunate. When, when Knock Hill, you know, or if ever Knock Hill comes off the calendar, it will be a very sad day, mate, because we've been without it before when I started driving. Uh, in touring cars, we we we, uh, we we went without it for a couple of years. So mm. yeah, I hope that doesn't happen again because it's a great place. It's a wonderful place. Uh, now we've talked a little bit about the title fight looking more normal. Let's pick around uh, in the individual races. Race one, you have to say straight away, Turkington absolutely looking back to his best again. Senna Proctor, very impressive indeed, shadowing him every move. A bit of a dull race from his point of view, but really showcasing just how strong that BTC racing package is. Uh, and he's very well gelled into that squad now as well. But particularly from Colin Turkington, he really, really needed that win. Yeah, exactly. That, that you know, it, it wasn't going to be, I mean, the, the saving grace for him was having a front wheel drive car near, you know, around and about him to, to defend from another rear wheel drive car, especially like ones like Aidan Moffat and people like that. But it, that just shows how good Colin is. You know, if you give him the car, you know, and the circuit's right, you're never going to have a question over him. There's never going to be a question. Um, you know, shadowing him. So he was always going to get that done. As soon as he got off the line, I was like, well, this is, that's, that race is won now. Um, but it was only when it come to race two when, when it, was, it was a bit more difficult. But yeah, you know, Colin is, you're always, in the media, you're always trying to not pick holes out of somebody, but you can, you can, only, you can only say negative things about someone who's won four titles when they're not performing at the very best, whether it's the car, the team, them, or everything together. So, you know, for Colin to, to win that race was you could see you could see how much it meant to him. He knew he, he knew he was back in the game as soon mm. as he won that race. It was a great weekend for him overall, to be fair. But like you say with Senna Proctor, um, Senna is very good around Knock Hill. He's out, I think he outqualified Ash Sutton in a Subaru there, um, or outdrove him all weekend actually when he was there a few years ago with Ash. And he's always been good in the junior formula as well. So I wasn't surprised to see how well um Senna went round there and Josh Cook as well who was if you've seen me laughing on the YouTube video he's just come right up to the window and knew I was on a Zoom call so he's a coach as well so that's why I was laughing yeah but Josh had a stellar stellar weekend except for race three when he had some kind of technical uh, problem but if he'd have been in that race he'd have won that and we'd be talking about him as well as the other two guys we've just spoken about no, he was very, very good. A very valiant effort from Josh Cook in race one in particular, shadowing Ash Sutton's every move for most of the race. And I have to say, we keep talking about the superlatives we run out of for Ash Sutton, but how well he drove in race one on full ballast. I mean, that some of the moves he was pulling off, particularly that terrific edge out race with Jake Hill in the middle of the race. I mean, Ash Sutton, he really just knows how to maximize every single opportunity he looks and searches every opportunity to get that little bit of extra pace out of a curb uh, and just the slightest hint of extra acceleration or a split second earlier than his opponents he maximizes every little fine detail to get the most he possibly can out of his equipment and out of his racecraft it's wonderful to watch yeah ma- massively and you know what the thing is with that jake is that um last year we he won the title with an inconsistent car when it was on form, it was on form. When it wasn't on form, it, in qualifying especially, it looked like a dog of a car to drive. Mm. But he still got himself where he needed to be and come good on the Sunday. Now he's having exceptional Saturdays and stellar Sundays. Mm. And, you know, and for me, this is a terrible thing to say, mate, but it, it's game over, really. Honestly, do I, really I think honestly... At the halfway point, do you really think it's game over? If Ash Sutton does not win this title, then I, I honestly, I just can't see anybody beating him. I honestly can't. Tom Ingram, him and Tom Ingram as drivers for me, are the, are the, best, the best boys by quite a percentage at the minute. By quite a percentage. What they've done individually, 
engineering those cars with their engineers and teams, what they have done is nothing short of a miracle mm. in my eyes. You've got the might of WSR and BMW, the might of Shedden, Robottom, Team Dynamics, X Factory Hondas, and they are making them look pretty, not average, they're just making them look normal. I mm. cannot get my breath how good Tom Ingram is this year, and I kind of expect to wear ashes. Ash, Ash, Ash will Ash will win this title, no doubt. There'll be people, there'll be weekends where it goes up and down. Ash will win this title, no doubt. And I, I hope that doesn't bite me. It was a betting match. Stick my, <laughs> well, stick my hat. We've got two months to find out. We've got two months to find out whether it's going to come back to bite you. We will see how that goes. Uh, another interesting uh, for, uh, point from race one, Rory Butcher. My goodness, he really does do well on home soil. His elbows were out. He was taking names out there, really putting on a bit of a show. And it looked like he'd got his mojo back. You know, after a couple of weekends where it had all gone awry, he could be part of this battle. If Thruxton hadn't been such a hogwash, he might have had a better opportunity and a better stake to be in this title fight. But on home soil, he just got himself back together. He was there swapping paint with Shedden in race two as well, doing a fantastic job in race one. It was really nice to see him put on a good show in the first race. Yeah, you know... Rory is, um, like you said, I think he's got the car more to his liking now. And he really come alive, didn't he, at, um, at Alton Park. Um, just like all them places he made up were, were amazing. And then from that third race onwards, he doesn't, you know, he's not really looked back. I know he had a problem in the last race. I think it was with Aidan Moffat, wasn't it? Or was that the second race? Yeah, had a, had a race. We'll talk about that. Yeah. But anyway, he, he is, listen, there's no doubt that Rory is one of the top six drivers. Full stop. It's just getting everything pinned um with the car in him so it makes it you know as, as easy to drive for him as, as it can because it looks like you know what we, the problem we've got in the uk is for drivers swapping around is that you know cars can be circuit specific and it's difficult to make sure that you are on top of the car um at each circuit because every circuit we go to is completely different it's it can be flat, it can be big curves, it can be bumpy, it can be high deg on the tyres. Everywhere is just different and it's it's how you change the car. I mean, the drivers, to be honest, the top 10 are probably, except for me, my, except for Tom Ingram and Ash Sutton, I think the top 10 drivers are, are probably as much as a muchness. It's just, it's just how they get the car to work for them and I think that's what Rory's got on top of now. So he's as fast as anyone now and it's, it's still good to see him right up there because speed works and uh, Gazoo, Toyota, they deserve it, to be honest, because they put a lot of hard work in. They really do. Another guy that I just wanted to uh, touch on briefly uh, from race one before we head on to race two, uh, Jake Hill, yet again. He's just right there, always getting that forward into a good position. The motor base team, from the start of the year, we talked about this, you know, it was a, a ragtag bunch of people pulled together to start a new operation in a way with Mark Blundell Motorsport. And right from day one, they have been able to get that chemistry to work fluently. It's just looked effortless at times. And in Knock Hill, again, we got to see Jake Hill in title fight mode. In all three races, he was in title fight mode, maximizing points, giving himself the best chance to move forward. It was, again, really, really nice to see that he came to the plate and he managed to bag a podium in race two, which again, we'll touch on. But it was a strong showing again from him in what is turning into his best season. This is his best season without doubt. And he'll probably be disappointed that he's not won a race yet. Um, but on the other hand, it just shot that like Jake's career is going up like his maturity. And it, mm. there's, a, there's a correlation. Um, you asked Jake to do this three years ago and he'd have been off backwards, but he'll probably have won two races, but he'd have, been, he'd have only finished seven. Do mm. you know what I mean? So his mature, he, he can, he's realising now that you have to finish. And if you've got waiting then you've just got to deal with it and and score points. I mean, I think he's only had third places when he's been on the podium. He hasn't had a... That's right. Don't, yeah, he hasn't had a second or a first yet, but it just shows you he's still there because what the drivers are starting to realise now is all you have to do in a touring car season is circle when Brands Hatch GP is at the end of the year and just be in with a mathematical chance. Yeah, It doesn't matter about anything else. It doesn't matter how you score. If you score 20, 20 points by, you know, I don't know, if you score 40 points over a weekend, but you've only had like three third places or 
you've had one win and a, and a seventh and a fourth. It doesn't matter how you do it. You've just got to make sure you score points, always score them. Jake has been another revelation. The new kids these days, I mean, they're just making like Shedden and people like that just look dead normal. When I, and I still obviously rate Gordon Shedden as a triple champion, but him and Colin Turkington are the elder statesmen in that championship. Obviously, Plato as well, but it just shows you how good these kids are. They are unbelievable. The guard has turned massively. Last year it was turning, and it's really, really now started to just be a difference in there. In driving styles and 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 how they apply themselves, it's just it's a, it's lovely to see. Yeah, really, really good stuff from the first race and from Jake Hill in particular over the weekend. Uh, let's look at race two. Uh, Ash Sutton again, just mind-numbing pace in the second race, storming to the win. Never even looked like he was going to lose that race once he got in the fight with Turkington. The big talking point, though, Colin Turkington is out in front. He's got his main oppressor on his tail. And who cracks under the pressure? It was Turks. That was really interesting to see. He ran wide. He made the rookie error. And that is a really telling factor from a man who is a four-time champion trying to make it five. And he's really feeling the heat. Ash Sutton has his backs to the ropes at the moment. This is a really tense time for him. Mm -hmm. You couldn't think, could you, of two more different people and two completely different approaches? I mean... Colin will only ever drive like Ash Sutton in the final weekend if he really needs to. And I went to say drive like Ash Sutton. I mean, take calculated-ish risks. Mm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I mean, but Ash drives like 100% all of the time. And yeah. I'm meeting Tim. I was actually really surprised how long Colin hung on for. And I was like, he deserves this win now. He does, and if he would have won that, oh my word! I know it's only a few mm. points between first and second, but if he'd have won that, he would have been. He would have left Knock Hill. I think he obviously believes he can still win it. I'm not saying that, but he would have left Hill at uh, Knock Hill feeling invincible. I will give you that. Mm. But I think he, that chicane. He just if he'd have got through the chicane and defended into Clark, he would have. He would have never. Ash would have never done him at the line. It wouldn't have been. It would have been finished. So. Colin is approaching that chicane knowing he cannot put a curb inch wrong. And he did. And he did because he must have seen the run that he got through the chicane. And he knew that Ash could take more, more curb on the right because Ash's car was set up perfectly for not. It was set up like a front wheel drive car. You could see on the television how much curb Ash was taking every time. Half a car's width more than... Colin, every time, every single time, the car's so soft, but so well supported by the the, the anti-roll bars and everything else that goes with it. Because it is a science. It's not just running soft. That is a science. I've spoken to my shit length in it, and it is a science how they've got that car going. So that, everything was going on in Colin's mind. And then as soon as he hit the first curb, I was like, game over. That's done. And he just bounced and understeered into the gravel. You just never see that. You never see it from that. That just shows you how much pressure Colin is under. But we've seen it before. We have seen it before. And I know that I say it's a dead cert that Ash is going to win the title, which a lot of touring car fans probably won't want to hear. But it just shows you that guy is just on another level. That was just, that was focusing, wasn't it? What he did to Colin, focus. Absolutely. Was. It was fantastic. But what it tells really from the first five rounds, if you look at the stats, I mean, Sutton has had one bad weekend which was Autumn Park. His best finish that weekend was an eighth. Other than that, he's never finished outside the points. So other than Autumn Park, he's been pretty much on perfect form. Every other driver in that top 10 has had at least two weekends where they've had a non-score or a DNF uh, within the races. So Sutton's consistency is what puts him ahead. And that's how you win the title, as you've mentioned many times. You know, the fact that he just keeps on putting in the point scoring finishes. And it's like we keep saying time and time again, it's not what happens when you're winning. It's what happens when you're not at the front. And Sutton is rarely outside the top five now, never mind the top 10. He just somehow manages to put himself in that position. It's really, really calculated. Uh, let's talk about Butcher, because Butcher was amazing in race one, amazing in the first half of race two. His move on Ingram, my goodness, that had everybody stepping up and paying attention in the final hairpin. Butcher was on point calculated spot on then we get to his battle with Aiden Moffat and I personally feel Tim Harvey called it spot on 
a great racing overtake from Butcher that he didn't tidy up. He actually pulled across when he could have stayed to the inside apex. He didn't need to move across at all uh, to take his line. He could have made the trajectory perfectly and still kept his place from Moffitt, not lost any time. Was that a rookie error from Rory Butcher or was it just a miscommunication? Rookie error every day of the week. Moffitt didn't do a thing wrong. Moffitt was on the left, stayed there, had to start to turn in. But by that time, Rory had put him still. I'll tell you exactly what he's done. Um, he's come over the brow. He actually looked, when I watched it, and I told Tim what I'd seen, it looked like he, he I don't think he moved across him. I just think he kept straight, um, but jinking a bit to the left because it looked like he had a front right lockup. And when you get a front right lockup, the car is going to go straight. It ain't going to deviate. So it ain't going to turn right. And I think it was a bit of late braking from Rory, but also just looking across. And he would have been looking at the apex, apex uh, you know, right of the um, the A pillar. So he'd have been, he'd have had his head turned the other way. And he's just literally break too late, locked the right front up, and he's just gone across the bowels of, of Aiden. Aiden, hundred percent, not his fault. Mm. Um, and then for me, you know, Rory has made a bit of a rookie error, but he wasn't helped by the front right lockup that I think I saw from that car. Um, but Tim called it dead right, like you just said, Jake, to be fair. And um, you're never going to win championships when it's like that. And I know it's, it's not exactly not what he meant, but it's just it, when you're in them positions, you've got to sometimes... That move was finished. He'd done it. Yeah, he'd done he'd the done move. move. It was done. Like you say, it was absolutely done. But yeah, it just, I mean, the damage bill that he's had this year from no fault of his own is just horrendous. I keep seeing him hard in the barriers and Alton as well. You know, it's like, it's a nightmare, absolute nightmare. Um, so yeah, I'm just hoping that, hoping that just the, the luck changes for him because I would love nothing more than Rory to be right up there in the championship because he, he gets there and then he drops away, he gets there and then he drops away. Mm. It just seems to be a bit of a nightmare somewhere in the weekend and you, you just can't afford to have it when you've got Ash Sutton sweeping up all weekend. Yeah, it's a tricky one. It is a tricky one. And you've got to be fair to the Toyota boys. You know, their their patience is very, very rock solid at the moment. Uh, hopefully, they're not going to have too many more difficulties towards the end of the year. A couple of Flotsam and Jetsam in that race. Obviously, at the start, we ended up seeing Sam Smelt in the advertising hoardings as he took avoiding action uh, off the start from uh, a slow-moving... Who was it that was slow off the line? Uh, was it Chris Smiley? It was Chris Smiley, yeah. So he had to dodge Smiley and obviously ended up in the advertising hoardings. Uh, typical problems when you've got different speeds and trying to compress the whole field into that tight turn one. Sadly, it was Nick Hamilton that got spat into the wall. Very unfortunate for him and for Team Hard. Uh, also, we saw Rick Parfit going off the road, just pushing that little bit onto the rumble strip. And the second you hit that curb and you're on the throttle, bang, it's just going to spit you off. And it's just so easy. And this is all part of his learning year, uh, obviously. Those little moments where you probably could have that saved and not a problem in a gt3 car which he's obviously used to but in a touring car it's just so difficult when that center of gravity shifts when you're on the curb and you hit the throttle in a gt3 car i think he would have saved that no problem in a touring car always going to throw you away yeah and a lot of the guys coming over from different race series they they're so raw the british touring cars and i'll tell you what makes it worse now is that like adam morgan and not just adam morgan actually a lot of drivers i speak to say they just cannot get their breath how competitive it is now like it's it's ridiculously competitive you know there's i can't remember what the stat was was it 25 cars old but under a second or something like yeah, that I think it, was. it was something silly and when you're looking for half a tenth you're going to make that mistake so you know parf and people like that are pushed into these mistakes um when probably you'd, you'd have got away with it you know a few years ago when you didn't have to push that hard to find that half attempt to move you up three three places on the grid so it's a difficult one um and like you say with the gt cars you know they're obviously a hard car to drive in they're super fast but they have traction and they've got abs they've got nothing in the touring cars you're regulating wheel spin you're regulating uh wheel slip you're, you're regulating lockups you just you're regulating everything this is it's very very difficult um but your first your first race season in british touring cars i always say is for free no one cares what you did. No one cares what you did. Because when you, when you sleep between October and then you get up and you go again in April, 
you're always half a second quicker full stop and you go up the grid. So people just have to get that first year out of the way and then crack on. And that's what I did. And that's what a lot of people did. Um, because you just, you know, you never looked at as a, as a threat in your first year because you're not expected to. So, so he'll, he'll learn. It won't be a problem for him. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to seeing what he can do in 2022, actually race three, uh, Tom Ingram. This is his moment, really, to go for the title, isn't it? And he feels it. He senses it. His overtaking moves, particularly the last one on Jelly in the hairpin, that was a prize fighter trading blows for a knockout. This guy is absolutely on it. And what he and Accelerate Trade Price Cars have been able to create with this Hyundai, uh, he's gelling with this car even more than he was at Toyota. Toyota, he was strong with the Hyundai. Yeah. It's like it's an extension of him now. He is absolutely on it. He's able to maximize the best of this car when he's got a good opportunity. He sensed that race three was his to claim. And once he made those first couple of moves on, it, it would almost look like it was never in doubt. You know, going back to that Toyota change to Hyundai, I just think that maybe the chassis is just more suited to, to the changes that he wanted to the car. It always looked like... Toyota, as amazing a car as it is, always looked like he was hanging on to it. The mm. Hyundai doesn't look as hard to drive. It looks pointy. And that move that you've just talked about at the hairpin, there's not many people that can do that. And did you see that you said about Rory Butcher kind of did the same thing in the Toyota? And a lot of that is from what they learned from Tom Ingram about having the car as pointy as they can mm. and having it very nosy so the front will go wherever you want. A lot of these touring cars, they have quite a bit of rear grip. So when you turn the steer and it takes a while for it to turn in, but he always seems to be able to get the undercut and drive underneath people when you just, you know, you just don't think it's going to happen. And next minute, bang, he was underneath. That was just, that was the move of the season. Yeah. And it was at 30 miles an hour max. <laughs> and it was <laughs> the move of the season. It was absolutely perfect. And do you know what? I said that Ash will definitely win the championship in my eyes. He will be, whatever happens, he will be run so close by Tom Ingram um, and his mentality. Because like you said, he pitched up in that third race and all we talked about in the studio was Tom Ingram and how he was going to do in this race. And even with the problems he had, the, he had electrical problems, he had a, a fuel pressure sensor by the sounds of it, high, low. Um, and then he had the, the gear cut not working. When you're driving like that, it's, sometimes you think, Shall I bother with this move? Because if I get in, if I, if it doesn't come off and I drive into someone, there wasn't any it wasn't worth the damage because the car was limping anyway. But he put it to the back of his mind, got past him, got off up the lead, and probably looked after him and managed the problem he had. Um, absolutely awesome. I mean, we talk about championship move from Ash Sutton on Colin Turkington through the chicane. If Tom was to win this championship, that would be one of the championship moves that I've seen this year yeah. um, because that's how much he wants it, in my opinion. I completely agree because if you look at the point standings at this phase, you know, uh, Sutton has 172 now. Ingram has 158. He's only 14 back. I mean, let's say Sutton has that second weekend where he has a problem. I mean, if he gets a difficult qualifying and gets spat off at Thruxton, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden Ingram's there. And if he has a solid weekend again, then Ingram could take the lead of this championship very easily. And then we really have a title fight on our hands for the last four weekends. There's no telling how it's going to go if Ingram shows his hand and does a better score next time to the tune of 14 points than Sutton. Those last four weekends, I mean, it's going to be one of the toughest fights because what we've had the last few seasons is Sutton, the young prize fighter coming up against the legends of Turkington and whatever. And it's worked out with Ingram's sort of nudging at the poking the bear a little bit just nudging in there getting close this year it's looking like it's the two young guns Sutton and Ingram they're those are the two that look like they're going to be the strongest title fighters and with them being so young so hungry so eager to prove they're the best anything could happen oh no doubt and let me tell you something and this is another thing that is going to bite me because I'm getting recorded <laughs> the championship the championship points will be so close leaving Thruxton, if I'm thinking right. It'll either be very, very close in in Ash Sutton's favour or Tom Ingram will leave Thruxton in... in If it's dry, Tom, Tom Ingram will leave Thruxton in my eyes as championship leader. And, and then it'll be reversed. It'll swing at Croft and then it'll swing back 
it will swing. There's loads of swings in it. Yeah. Um, but now, you know, Tom Ingram nearly pulled pole out of the bag when we were at Thruxton last time. So, you know, he knows going to Thruxton, he's in better shape than probably Ashes. There's nothing worse than hanging onto a rear wheel drive car around Thruxton. Nothing mm. worse. You know, it's hard enough in a front wheel drive car, but like you say, there's, there's loads of swings yet to come. Um, and there'll be DNFs for the top guys. But I'm starting to think that both Ash and Tom have had their bad luck already. So uh, that's why I think it's a two horse race and it will be mm. till the end of the year. Yeah. It's, it's it's a good bet. I mean, if we look at what happened at Thruxton last time, you know, two ninth places and the race three reverse grid win for Sutton at Thruxton. Tom Ingram, second, sixth, and then obviously had a moment and ended up at the back. But Ingram was leading the points of the two of them. So mm. interesting that yeah, you're absolutely right. Ingram is better placed to take points off Sutton. But this is all going to be on Ash, especially now he's going to be on, you know, heavier ballast. So we'll have to see how that one uh, works out. Josh Cook. Race three, so unlucky. This is the kind of moment that takes away your chance of a title fight. He's been so awesome throughout the Knock Hill weekend. He was right there with Sutton in the mix in race one. He was steady and consistent in race two. Some great performances there. A third and a fourth. He was looking like he could be the top point scorer from that weekend. And with him out on lap one, we'll never know just how good he could have been. He could have won that race, potentially. He could have been one of the ones to charge through like Ingram. And he could have been a race winner. Jake, he would have won that race, mate. Do you reckon, no yeah? doubt. Oh, no doubt, mate. He would have he would have won that race, no doubt. It would have been a battle with him and Ingram, but I honestly would have put Josh in that. I mean, I cannot believe, you know, the problem they've had is a technical problem. That failure has happened. Tom Ingram will tell you that. But I couldn't believe it was just the worst thing. I think that'll have, that, that will be and this is horrible to say again, but I really think that could be near enough the end of, of Josh's fight because he would have left, I reckon, in third place in the points, not far off Colin Turkington mm. and, and really on the front foot going to Thruxton. He won twice. You know, he could have put in, he could have vaulted himself into Tom Ingram territory there after mm. Thruxton. I know I'm looking far ahead, but I mean, that, what that will have done to him mentally, I wouldn't even like to ask him. Because mm. he was so good this week, at the weekend just gone at, at uh, Knock Hill. So good. I'm, I'm devastated for him. Um, there's no one, no, there's not many drivers that, that drive as hard as Fair now. He's had his moments, Josh, but as Fair and as clever and calculated as he does. He, him, Ash and Tom Ingram are the best driver engineers on the grid on, in the UK, full stop. They are the cleverest kids you will meet. They are switched on 100%. So I'm devastated that whatever's happened, technically, we've been robbed of someone that really deserves to be in that top three fight. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult one. It is a really difficult one. And the other one that was tough to see retiring uh, in race one was Jake, uh, in race three, sorry, was Jake Hill. You know, again, that could have been a really good point saw from him, a third and a sixth. Uh, from the first two races and he was on a top five run he was looking for another top five run he was another one who could have been right there in the mix with turkington sutton ingram in terms of decent points scores it's the worst possible time to be picking up a dnf and it is jake's first it's his first retirement of the season but it's the worst possible time to be retiring because you are trying to stay with the Suttons, the Turkingtons, the Ingrams, you've got to be nailing it every time. And to get a retirement, which you could say wasn't really of his doing, it's such mm. a difficult moment to take it. It is. You know, any DNF's a nightmare, but, you know, I, it just shows you how fast the top two are because they've had awful Ulton Parks and they're still gapping these guys. Right, um, you know, it's just like Jake, that DNF would have been like, well, that's just one of those things, but a, a couple of years ago. But now there's so many massive, massive point scoring uh, drivers out there over weekends now. It's just, be, it's getting ridiculous. You can't, like we've said, you, we used to say, oh, you can't drop a weekend. You actually can't drop a race now. No. You have to score some points in a race. Otherwise, you are going to get left behind. And that's what Colin Turkington knew before he got to Knock Hill. So, you know, that is that, that is the difficult 
pill to swallow because Jake doesn't deserve that. Um, you know what, what's going mm. on there in the race, and and but again, as long as he's in the title fight at the last weekend, which I think he will be, I think there'll be six of them mathematically, um, and I would all and and he said this himself. I put my money on him to be the one that battles whoever the top two are uh, going into the title fight because he's the one on a cold, wet, windy October evening that you would put all your money in, on and go, Jake Hill, please, <laughs> out the back, flat out. That's yeah, he's the one you go all money. in for, isn't he? Exactly, yeah. So that, that's how I think it is. But yeah, we're so fortunate to have these drivers. They are just exceptional talents. They really are. I'm glad I'm not in it anymore to have to battle them. <laughs> it's a terrific show now. Speaking of uh, not in it anymore, there's one guy who is starting to raise questions. Uh, a few people I've been speaking to over the weekend were looking at him and kind of thinking, is this the beginning of the end? Jason Plato. I mean, he looked competitive in race three. But if you look at his stats over the last few weekends, I mean, the first weekend, exceptional. He came straight out of the blocks, never lower than sixth place. He had a sixth, a fifth, and a second. I and mean, everyone was thinking, ah, oh, here we go. JP's back. Then we get to the second round. No race in the points at all for Snetterton. Brands Hatch Indy, back in the points every race, with a fourth place in the last one, but there was still a little bit of work to do. Very difficult at Autumn Park. His best result was a seventh. And then we come to Knock Hill, an eighth and a ninth, and just scraping into the points in race one. How long do you give it? When you're someone like Jason Plato, when you're a two-time champion, when you are the biggest name in the sport, there's no two ways about it. We can talk about Turkington. We can talk about Sutton and Ingram. Jason Plato is the biggest name in the same way that Jeff Gordon used to be in NASCAR, in the same way that Michael Schumacher used to be in Formula One. Jason Plato is the headline act. He is the star of British touring cars, still is. How long do you give it when all you're fighting for is a seventh, an eighth, a ninth, a tenth, when that's your maximum? And it's been that way for the last four weekends now. Just how long does your patience last in that situation? Yeah, do you know, can I just tell you something? Um, if you put Jason in an FK8 Honda, you would see him up there with the likes of Cookie and Proctor and yep. Shedden and Hampton, absolutely no doubt. This is not being derogatory to PMR, who are a great team. I just think that that year out has absolutely nobbled them. Mm. I just think that the game moved on that much in that year when they were kind of stood still with, with different drivers coming in and they were forced to do that. Mm. They didn't get any direction. Not didn't get any direction. They didn't get as much direction from a yeah. Plato um, engineering-wise because what you just said about Thruxton in the first weekend, that shows how good Jason is and how good the car probably isn't because he outdrove that car that weekend for me. Mm. And that was when we come away from Thruxton, me and Tim Harvey were like, geez, I think we can probably say Thruxton was interesting, but we leave it there. We don't take anything from it because it just was one of them weird weekends where it was wet, dry. Um, and I don't think we can take anything from it. I honestly think that they have got big issues with, with them. Um, with the car that mm. they, I thought they would have got on top of by now, but they have had no pace. I mean, they're just, Dan Lloyd is a very good driver, like you know, yeah. a very good driver. And between the both of them, they're not being able to engineer the car. I just find it staggering. Maybe the car has come to the end of its life. It's, it's quite an old car now, really, in, this, yeah. in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. So it might, it might be that, but, you know, Jason isn't as fast as he used to be. Let's not, let's not beat around the bush. He's a bit older. Um, and you do lose a bit of time. I'm not saying I'd be able to do as good as he is at the minute, but, you know, it just shows you that he got a reverse grid, no weight, and he ended up, did he end up 11th or something? I can't remember. Um, I think so. Yeah, I think so. It was really quite far back down, wasn't he? So, for me, that is that just shows you, um, he was down in ninth, that just shows you to go from the front to the back, and I know he got a little tap here and there, but the car just wasn't up to speed, it mm. really wasn't. And Jason, Jason's faster than that. He really is. So yeah. it is. No, he still is. I mean, I mean we, we proved it when the difficulty in conditions are there. You know, Thruxton, he got results, but he was absolutely devastated. I mean, I've never seen anyone look more fed up with a second place finish than Jason Plato. He knew coming out of that weekend, you know, we were lucky. We were very lucky. We got points there. And when we go to the next round, we are definitely going to have to find something. This time when we yeah. go to Thruxton, 
I think it's going to be very telling because we're obviously going there in August when it's going to be hot, when it's going to be warm, when it's going to be a very big scalp in that package. This time we're going to see really what that car is capable of. And I think everybody in the team is going to have, rather sadly, some long faces. Yeah, I think that they. this is how PMR will now... People have, like yourself and me have raised the question about knock-hill, reverse grid, front row, back to ninth. It's going to, the emphasis will be on that team and where they qualify and how they race because if they have a bad thrusting, people are just going to go, right, it's the car. Um, and it's a horrible mindset to, to be in. You know, Jason is, and I've driven the same car as Jason in an RML cruise um, for different teams. I've seen how that guy operates. He might be the smoker, he might be the drinker, he might be the Larry lad. He is one of the most meticulous drivers over data and staying yeah. until 10 yeah. o'clock at night to make sure things are right. I have ever, ever seen. There's only a couple of other drivers I've seen like that. And Jason, is, don't, don't mistake him as someone who doesn't care. I'm not saying you do, but a lot of people out there probably go, oh, he's just having a giggle. He ain't. He'll be devastated if he doesn't get that 100th win. That's all that matters to him. You offer him a title? Or a hundredth win, I think he'd go hundredth win. Oh, absolutely, day. he's going to go a hundred wins because you know a title is a title. You join a list of people, and that's great. But a hundred wins, even in British touring cars, even if you look at people like Sutton and Ingram who are coming up through the ranks, looking mm. at how competitive it is now, a hundred wins in British touring cars in the modern era, it just sounds completely impossible, completely impossible. Yeah. And to be continuing to be at that yeah. level to get a hundred wins. Saturn and Ingram are going to be have to doing this in their late 50s. That is how they're going to have to get to that point. I mean, JP has been so stunning in the British touring cars since 1997. First time out, bang, pole position, quicker than Alain Menu. That is how good he is. He is the best that the championship's ever seen. There's no question about that. To be that quick from day one and to sustain it in the championship for 25 years. Come on, guys, 25 years. He has still been that core talent. And you're right. If you put him in one of the front-running cars, he'll be at the front. No two ways about it. And uh, it, it's phenomenal that people are starting to talk about, you know, is this the end of his career? I don't think it is. I think all he needs is to get the car that he feels he's got a gel with. The second he gets that car, he's going to wow everybody and remind everybody why, you know, you know, why he is the king, why he's the god. And there's going to be a lot of people who will need to shut up at that point. No, nope, I couldn't have put it better myself, mate, definitely. And that's, that's what you'll see. Be interesting to see what Jason does next year because, yeah, they need something They need something new for him to drive. And that, I don't know. Uh, um, yeah, I think you can only... I think the cars have just moved on so much that mm. they've been in limbo a bit. So, yeah, which is a shame because it's a great-looking car, the Astra, and it has had good success, but... It, it needs something, otherwise Jason yeah. will get fed up. People will only battle him in the midfield. There's just no point. So, last talking point, really, before we think about Thruxton. We've got an incredible title fight brewing. We've got Sutton on 172 and Ingram on 158, as I said. Turkington's win and his second place in race two, that brings him right back in, 138. So it's a big deficit, but it's not impossible. He's 20 off Sutton. Uh, uh, sorry, he's uh, 34 off Sutton and he's 20 off Ingram. So it's doable. There is still a chance. Up in fourth place, Gordon Shedden is suddenly P4. Where the hell did that come from? He's just been so consistent all the way through this year. Remember back to Thruxton when we were there going, oh, I don't know, Gordon, maybe this wasn't a good idea after all. Crash in race one, 18th race two, P4. Oh, well, it's a wet race. But no, Shedden has been the resurgent story of the season. He's made his mark come back. And he is now ahead of Robottom. Everybody was saying, oh, it's Dan Robottom's show now. You know, he's, he's, he's got it. Shedden's not got it anymore. No yeah. chance. Shedden's right back in there. Yes, he's got 129. Thruxton hurt him, obviously, in terms of his score. But if you take away those two races, he's had points score in very nearly every race. Two seconds, two thirds, two fourths. Runs in the top five nearly every race now. I think he's back to his best. Yeah, I think so. But I, I will I will show caution with that, though, because the reason he's in front of Robottom is because it's not because Shedden had a fantastic weekend. He had a good weekend, but Robottom was dreadful at Knock Hill. Dreadful. Yeah. He had a terrible time. I, I, I was hearing mutterings of Matt Neal being absolutely fuming because 
I think Robottom turned up in a mindset that he was going to win everything, which is, right. as a sport, and that's what you'd want to do. But he's always tried to caution, you know, tread with caution, mate. Matt Neal's done a lot. He's won a lot of titles. He knows the score. And it, I think it bit him. I think he maybe overdrove. I don't know. But mm. um, I expected more from Robottom. And, and he let his guard down. And Turkington at Shedden has, has drove over him and drove up the road. That now... As we go to Ruxton, where Shedden, I think, will stretch his legs a bit over row bottom. I think that's going to now be the now going to they're going to gap. He's going to have a little bit of a gap, and row bottom needs to keep an eye on that because you know he was the golden boy at Ulton, like amazingly. So he needs to take stock, you know, of what he's done and, and what's happened at Knockout. I hope he looks over it and sees what was wrong. Yeah, it's an interesting point you raise because obviously Dan Row bottom has just come off winning his first British touring car win in one of the best teams in the sports history. Now, when you get that kind of opportunity to win uh, and you have a great weekend off the back of it, everything sort of clicks. I mean, he never finished outside the top six at Alton. Very impressive. Uh, fastest laps, poles, one, two. It's such a great run from him at Alton Park. To then come to Knock Hill, you've had a bit of time to mull it over and you think, right, yeah, we can do this. We can, we can make this happen. It's so difficult, I guess, to kind of balance that confidence increase that you get with a little bit of your own racing driver mentality, that little bit of ego. You won your first British Touring Car race. You've been there. Is there a challenge when you've got so much hard work you put into it and then you've got that first British Touring Car win? How difficult is it to sort of balance your own internal judge, your own internal ego meister to just kind of say, you need to chill out a bit here. This is a long journey to get to the top of the sport you cannot allow that little cockiness of oh, I've just one to bring you down that must be quite a challenge when you're in the heat of that moment yeah I think it's the most difficult part I was thinking about it the other day when when you have a when you have your first win I mean I'm not saying that Dan was arrogant um but you do, your mindset changes so you turn up at places and you're like well oh, I should be fine now and I cannot think of anyone off the top of my head, that has won their first race and then had a really good weekend the next weekend. It's mm. always come downhill. And I don't know, I actually don't know why that is. I remember I went to Thruxton after winning at Alton and I was awful. I mean, I was off the pace, like completely. Um, and some of it was the weight. And I know Dan had some weight in as well. But, and he did qualify with weight, quite a bit of weight. But I just think you can take your eye off the ball a bit. And I think mm. that's the difference between a Gordon Shedden and, and a Dan Robottom who's won their first race, you know. And Dan will learn from that. And it's it's it, the best medicine is to have a bit of a nightmare and learn from it. Um, so, yeah, there is that men mentality side of it. Um, but, yeah, they, he just need, he needs to sit down, take stock, speak to Matt Neal, look at what's gone on and take it from there. Because we went from talking about him being in with a shot at the title from coming away and having a terrible it was a terrible weekend and Gordon just got on with it like he knows what to do and and, and cracked on um, and just to go back to what you were saying about Gordon Shedden being back up there I think it's so tight in that little battle from third downwards that to me where Gordon Shedden is that's a battle for third place that's not a battle for the title they they won't win the title this year absolutely not it's a um, yeah it's a tricky one because you've got Turkington Shedden Hill Cook Rowbottom even Jelly is there. And even technically, you know, Moffat and Morgan aren't a million miles away from it either. So if they have a decent run for the end of the season, Butch is there even on 102 in 11th place. Proctor is climbing up the ladder. He's 12th now. I mean, look at his season. He had a bit of a shaky start. Okay. But his points haul since round three has been phenomenal. The only people that will win this title, if it's not Ash Sutton, <laughs> will be Ingram. Strong possibility. Colin Turkington. Strongish possibility. The rest of them, they will not win the title. I'll, I'll guarantee you that now. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So we go to Thruxton. We've obviously been to Thruxton once before already, but this will be a completely different racetrack to what we saw at the first round. The first round, it was cold. It was wet. It was windy. There was an absolute lottery in all three races as to who was going to get on top of it. And the drivers that commanded it, Josh Cook with a perfect setup, with a perfect balance of car, and Sutton with a fighting drive. So what are we going to see from Thruxton? This time, as we've already mentioned, the rear-wheel drive cars are going to be a nightmare. 
in Thruxton mm. to stay on top of. Sutton is one of the only drivers on that grid who I think will do a fairly decent job of it. But there's no two ways about it. Front row drive is going to be the way to go at Thruxton. What do you see happening? Is Ingram going to stretch clear? Uh, yeah, I think like I touched on before, I think I think Ingram will have a stellar weekend. Um, you know, let, let's just say that the way that Tom's been working the last few rounds is start from the back, work your way up, try and win the last race. That's how. That's what his mentality is. Ash Sutton's is start as high up as I can, do as well as I can in the first race and be in the top six probably, and then win the second race and then just do well in the third. So it's different mentalities from the top two, from front to the back, how they operate. I think that this will be one of the only times Tom will be going to a circuit thinking, right, full, like near maximum ballast, I can still work from the front and have a really good race one, good race two, and an okay. Like, I think he'll have an Ash Sutton knock hill at Thruxton. This is what I think Tom will have. And I think it will be the opposite way round for, for Ash as well. I think Ash will have a, a Tom Ingram uh, <laughs> knock hill. If you see what I mean, so I mm. think they're going to be like completely opposites how they do it, um, and I think that Josh Cook, like you said, who had an amazing weekend um, at Thruxton, I think he's going to vault himself into that battle for third place in the in the championship because uh, I think he'll have I think he will have a, at least one win, and if he doesn't, he'll be on the podium twice. Sounds exciting to me. Well, Thruxton is not far away; it is just. Uh... Next weekend, essentially. So it's definitely going to be very exciting. You've got a dash trackside at Autumn Park. I've got a dash over to a commentary box. It's been an amazing undercut once again, Paul. Thank you very much for your insight. Let's see what happens. Yeah, let's see what happens, mate. And good luck at Le Mans. And um, yeah, I'm going to look. But I never watch Le Mans, but I'm going to watch, mate, because it's, uh, it's you. new. And uh, I'm going to watch, mate. So it'll be cool. Very nice indeed. Thank you very much indeed, guys, for listening. And uh, of course, we'll see you for Undercut Part 6 from Thruxton. See you soon.